This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Good morning and welcome to Southern Remedy. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And this is your Southern Remedy program where you can call in with any type of question about your health care or the health care of someone near and dear to you. You can always send those emails to remedy at mpbonline.org. Well, it's still hot here in the south and a few days of cool weather just as a tease. But, man, I have just been sluggish every day. I think everybody is just sort of plodding through things. Please be careful. We've been talking about hot weather, I think, every week pretty much. Uh, But we do want you to be careful out there, and especially this week. I think the high did not check it today, but I, I think it's upwards of uh, 105 to 108 is the actual temperature forecasted for tomorrow. So please be aware of that and to plan accordingly if you uh, can stay out of the sun during the midday hours. Maybe do your work outside early in the morning, although still want to be aware it's going to be hot then, probably up in the 80s. Uh, and then later in the afternoon. <clears throat> and then also keep in mind, just because we're in the humid south, right, um, that you're not going to be able to cool yourself off as easily. So even though you do hydrate, if you have younger individuals in the house, make sure that they're taking those precautions too. I know schools started up in school sports, including the fall sports um, for uh, uh, men and women. You want to make sure that you are, you know, appropriately Uh, that they're appropriately supervised and doing those kinds of things. And I know most coaches and teams now do a lot better job of this than in the past, but uh, extraordinary uh, temperatures and conditions uh, that are out there right now. And if you feel a little funny after that, if your child or you feel sort of funny, rest, come inside, cool off. Um, If you continue to feel bad after about 30 minutes or so, you might need to get yourself checked out because you can have electrolyte problems. You can have all kinds of different things that can happen to you. Um, I've seen everything from kidney stones to uh, rhabdo, which is a breakdown of muscle cells in uh, extreme uh, weather conditions and uh, repetitive movements uh, to acute kidney failure. So there's lots of different things that could happen. And you don't have to be old to um, or have a lot of medical problems to experience that. So you want to be careful about that. Um, but uh, just a wor- wor- word of warning as people go out, including for myself, I think I divulged last week. So this is where, you know, you, your doctor finally says, hey, I messed up. Um, so I went out and uh, actually got a little bit hotter than I should have. So I've been trying to take my own advice right now and um, and make sure that um, – that I'm appropriately cool. This is Southern Remedy, the program where you can call in with any kind of topic that you might have. Maybe it's a new symptom, new medication. Uh, Maybe it's something that's just been bothering. You just want to ask a question about that that is involving your health care or the health care of someone else in your family or a friend. You know, I do give you permission to be that first caller. So I'm just waiting on you right now. We will award you appropriately with the designation of first caller for Southern Remedy, which is a high designation that we only bestow on one caller a week. So just throwing that out there. Um, speaking of like looking at your health care and thinking about things, there's two ways to look at it. I was just talking with our producer, Kevin Farrell, earlier uh, before the show and talking about reactive uh, decisions and proactive decisions. And there's different times to have both of those. A proactive decision is something that you would take steps to help prevent something. And this is probably, you know, we all react to different things that happen. So if you do go outside in the heat and you feel pretty sapped of energy or you have nausea and vomiting, uh, maybe you have <clears throat> shortness of breath and a cough and you think, I need to get checked out. But, um, and that's fairly easy to get our attention about that. But it's quite the opposite thing to, to 
proactively do some things. And those are equally as, equally as important because some things sneak up on you. And by the time you have symptoms, it can be really late in the game. An example is uh, heart disease. So you, you, most people, when they think about heart disease, they think, well, if I have a blockage in the arteries in my heart, maybe if it gets to be about 30%, 50% blocked, that's the point where I would have symptoms. So it's actually anywhere from 70 to 90% blocked. So you can be really advanced um, and maybe even have a total blockage of an artery um, before you have those actual first symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, and some of the more, you know, sort of classic symptoms of angina. Um, so there is, you know, there is a lot to, to be said about all the things that you need in a screening. Um, if you're perfectly healthy, there's still some things that you need. There may be some blood work, depending on your age and your risk stratif stratification, uh, things that we can check for that we can do something about. Um, hepatitis C screening is another one. So I can remember in training, you know, we had a few uh, back in the 90s, a few treatments for hepatitis C um, infections and uh, virus, viral infections. But generally, <clears throat> most people, they weren't very effective. And a lot of people were uh, had a lot of side effects with those. Much more effective therapy now. It's something that can be treatable. And why do you need to treat it? Well, because, again, it might be without any symptoms, asymptomatic for years or decades. And then uh, until you um, until you develop cirrhosis or you develop liver cancer from that, and that can be a long time from when you're exposed. So just another um, example of uh, where most people now they're recommending adults at a certain age to get uh, an HIV test, to get a hepatitis C test, just as a screening measure, because if it does come up positive, we can actually do something about that. So those are all things that you can proactively do, and you may not can keep up with all all of them. Um, it's easy to look on a, a reputable website about what you need. There's a lot of stuff on there, though, that you don't need. And some people come in and say, hey, I want my full body MRI that I have yearly. And I'm like, no, nah, actually, well, there's not really an indication for that. Um, although some people might advocate that it's not really um, in the um, not really in the suggested things that they would uh, that they would recommend. So keep that in mind. Um, but that's you know some people would say oh, I feel great. Why should I see a doctor? It's for those proactive things. It's sort of like saying you know my car is running just fine. Why would I take it in to get the oil change or to look and see if there's anything else going on? Somebody needs to be looking at it. Whether that's you or an expert on it, um, that is something that that needs to happen. And our human bodies are the same way. Like we need to have check-ins proactively so that we don't progress to something that's more serious like chronic diseases, heart disease, stroke, um, cancers, all of those things are sort of fit into that. So just think about that. And uh, if you want to know that, you know, there's a lot of, again, websites. So the uh, if you're an adult, the American College of Physicians or American Academy of Family Practice, they have some guidelines about that. If you have a child, um, the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics has uh, great information there. They actually have a website called healthychildren.org, uh, O-R-G that has a lot of good information about what to expect, the normal things, and sort of those proactive things that you would normally do and are recommended to improve the health of your child and the rest of your family. So check that out. On uh, Those are the three or four that I would say are, are better than, than most on providing that information. There's a couple others out there, um, certainly, that uh, depending on what you're looking at. You know, we're about to get into a couple of seasons of respiratory illnesses. Um, so this is the typical time of year when we start to see that ramped up. The last few years have shown some differences, and year to year you can see some differences. So most people, in fact, I had this question of a patient the other day in, in clinic saying, hey, when do I get my flu shot, you know? Um, and generally speaking, we would say as, you know, physicians, get it whenever it becomes available. Um, usually those are rolled out and timed to flu patterns in the rest of the globe and the rest of the, of the world, uh, depending on what those patterns are because we know there are certain areas that get the flu before we do and it sort of circulates that's also the way that they make an educated uh, calculation about what types of flu that we're likely to see here um, 
but you don't need to wait necessarily until mid flu season to get your flu vaccine. So some people would say, well, I'm just going to wait till November uh, or December even and get my flu shot because they never got the flu before that. Well, it's really not so much about you as it is those flu patterns. Um, so, you know, this year's flu may start a little bit easier. We're starting to see an uptick in COVID cases, too. So, again, if you are in that uh, those groups that are more at risk, elderly, immunocompromised, you certainly want to take some precautions there. If you haven't gotten a bivalent uh, COVID vaccine, you probably need to get that, especially if you're in those groups. Uh, if you haven't gotten it in the last three months. So just be aware of that. And again, some proactive things that you can do and maybe even thinking about how you interact in certain environments. You know, if we have low levels of flu or no levels of flu in the community, I might, you know, do things a little bit differently than if we have high levels of flu, uh, particularly if you're elderly. So you want to um, just uh, keep that in mind and take some precautions there um, as we move into the fall time. We're going to go to Daphne from Mobile. Good morning, Daphne. Good morning. That's a great name for the Mobile area, Daphne. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What's your question this morning? My question is, my aunt, um, who's 60, um, 69, and she has under her breast, we have a, uh, she has a lot of moles that are growing under there. And um, she had a mammogram. It didn't show cancer or anything. But we we're just concerned why these moles are keep developing under a yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I do see that from time to time. Let me ask one question. You may or may not know the answer to this. Do you know if she has uh, diabetes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so moles or skin tags can sometimes be, uh, and in several other skin lesions too, can be associated with different systemic medical conditions. And those areas, um, you can have darker colorations of the skin called acanthosis. You can have uh, true what we would call moles or nevi that, that pop up. You can also have things like seborrheic keratosis, which are larger uh, sort of raised waxy feeling lesions like uh, on the skin. But all those are usually benign. They probably need to be looked at. Usually I'll, my patients, particularly those who have type 2 diabetes and have these in those locations you mentioned, wouldn't be such a bad idea to get a dermatologist to at least look at them. If they see something that's suspicious, you can take a biopsy of it. Now, you mentioned like mammograms, which are good, and sometimes breast cancer can have skin changes with it. But usually from the skin changes that you're describing, uh, an X-ray really wouldn't pick up much much there, even if it's a mammogram. Mammogram is just a fancy X-ray, basically, uh, that focuses in on the breast tissue itself. But uh, a dermatologist laying eyes on those, and maybe if there's one that's suspicious, doing a skin biopsy, which they can do in the office, very minimally invasive, um, they can get a look at exactly what's going on with any of those and then, you know, give you some advice on how to treat them. Now, they do sometimes, depending on how large they are and if they're raised, even if it's not something like a skin tag, it can be uncomfortable just because of the skin moving back and forth with that. Um, so those can be removed from a, you know, a cosmetic it's not really cosmetic from a therapeutic standpoint, so it's not hurting them. But um, but I, that's where I would go. If for somebody who has type 2 diabetes, it's common to have more of these in skin fold areas. So in the armpit, the axilla, uh, around the neck, um, you can see these little uh, tags develop. It doesn't mean that everybody who has those has diabetes, but it's found more often in people who do have diabetes, which is why I asked that question. Okay. Thank you for the answer. And also I need to ask, um, she complains a lot about uh, around that whole area is so dry. We put lotion, you know, on her, but she seems to scratch, especially when it's uh, hot. But uh, so is there anything else we can do? Yeah, and and it's bringing a couple of other things to mind, too. Because that area has skin on skin, and if it's dry and itchy, 
you can also have um, a fungal infection of the skin like ringworm in that area too and it can look differently in that area so again i think that's just another another way you know reason that a dermatologist needs to look at it it's hard for me to you know uh, you'd have to look at it really to sort of see if it's you know if it's that but uh yeah lotions you can use i would stay away from the ones that have a lot of fragrance in it because sometimes those can be more irritating um and the uh ones that have alcohol in them which will end up drying your skin out they feel really good because they're a little bit cooler when they go on but the the ones i usually recommend are things like eucerin aquaphor uh, those are two good brands. Uh, there's a, there are others out there, but they tend to be more like lanolin based, um, and they don't dry the skin out long term. And you can't use too much of those. You know, you just have a big vat of it, and then just keep lathering it on. But I'd have the dermatologist look at that too. Now, in diabetes, your skin can dry out more. That's a little unusual to see that in in folds of skin, like the bre- breast right underneath the breast, but. Um, it's possible that that might be playing into it, too, with, with her diabetes. All right. Thank you so much, and I am enjoying your program. Well, thank you, Daphne. We do appreciate you calling and listening. Um, you have a great day. If you don't catch uh, the whole portion of the show, or maybe you just catch a, a partial conversation, you're like, oop. Where's the rewind on here? Uh, You can actually go back and listen to the show several different ways. Probably the easiest one is to utilize your favorite podcasting app and search for Southern Remedy, and you can download that, listen, pick the ones you want to listen to. Uh, It has our full lineup of Southern Remedy programs on there. Or you can go to our website, mpbonline.org. You can search in the archives. Do try to get those up fairly quickly within a day or so. Uh, and uh, and go back and listen to different portions of those. You can skim over if you didn't like what I said during one section, skim over that and get to the section you're most interested in. Goodness knows I talk a lot. So um, <laughs> at least my family says that. So um, but uh, you you can uh, zoom in on the on the sections that you missed or that you're most interested in or suggest that to somebody else. It's a great way to invite other people to uh, listen to the content that we deliver here, which that's the whole purpose is we get that out there for the full, for the whole state. Uh, and they can start watching or listening to the program, too. So on Wednesdays, we don't really limit it to any one topic. We open it up to whatever is on your mind. And I know somebody's got something on their mind this morning. Um, speaking of what's on your mind, you know, what is we talked a little bit at the top of the hour about, you know, what is. Uh, what is proactive and reactive and those kinds of things. So the other thing is, what, what can you expect when you have diabetes? And what are, my, what are the targets for that? You know, we, we treat to different things. Um, one of the things that we treat to is something called an A1C, a hemoglobin A1C. And that's just a three-month average of blood sugar. And then there's also fasting blood sugars or blood sugars are after you eat, like one or two hours after you eat. Depending on your regimen, what medications you're taking, your physician may want to zoom in on one or more of those. If uh, at the very least, they're going to be looking at that A1C, which is that average, but you can have variations with an average, right, up and ups and downs throughout the day. So they may want you to um, to check a couple of other things, too, like a fasting when you first wake up, glucose, um, and uh, maybe some others. And then we have newer methods of doing that, like a Dexcom, which is a continuous um Uh, blood glucose monitoring system. So it's a little device that fits on your skin and it monitors your glucose. You can hook it up to your phone or lots of other things. And uh, it's real nifty to to look at what that range is to try to pick the best medications for you. So just keep that in mind. There's several different ways of doing that. And then based on your age and how tight of control that your physician is really looking for, you know, a younger individual uh, with not a whole lot of other problems, an A1C, hemoglobin A1C less than six, six and a half might be appropriate. If you're older, um, over the age of 65 or 70, maybe an A1C in the range of seven to eight might be appropriate. It's just really going to be individualized for that patient and sort of what their situation is. Um, so that's that's a question that comes up quite often in my clinic. Probably you're thinking about that too. I'm going to go to Beth on the road. Good morning, Beth. Good morning. I was calling to ask questions about I have three children in their 30s, 
who've all in the last year or so started using those Zen, Z-Y-N, little packets that they put between their gum and their cheek. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I think it's caffeine. Is that correct? Yeah, caffeine and I think nicotine, too. Um, so I think there's a little bit of different. Yeah. Uh, ni- n- yeah, nicotine is the biggest one. It doesn't have all the other stuff that, say, dipping does, so it doesn't have all the other materials. It's pretty much just the, the nicotine itself and maybe a sweetener or something like that. But, yeah, I am, a, I am aware of that, and a lot of people are using those sort of like you do caffeine as a stimulant. Uh, particularly if they're doing things where they need to stay up, if they're driving long distances, uh, if they're, um, yeah, so so doing different things. I know in colleges I use them a lot too. So, uh, you know, in, in comparison and contrasting the differences with caffeine, you know, caffeine actually is recommended as a an adju- uh, adjutant, something you can take to help stay up in different ways things. So for instance, it's pretty safe if you don't have a lot of other medical problems. If you do have heart disease, you may want to check with your physician, but and they want may want to limit the amount of caffeine. But however you're getting caffeine, it can be useful to um increase your awake state if you're having to do something like driving or, you know, doing something like a long shift of of work. Nicotine, however, has many more negative side effects. And even though you sort of remove with the Zen package, you remove those direct side effects on the tissue, at least theoretically, we don't have any long-term evidence on this yet, um, if it's doing damage on the, the gum tissue. Um, but uh, it still gets absorbed into your bloodstream, and that can be detrimental to your blood pressure and can also lead to heart disease. So it's still... Not the best thing to do. Um, I think we're still going to have to, unfortunately, sort of see what kind of long-term effects there are. But if you had to choose between caffeine and Zen, um, then I would choose caffeine. If you had to choose between caffeine, Zen, and just uh, a better schedule and more and more quality sleep, I would do the better schedule and more quality sleep if we're talking about overall health. But, um, but yeah, I am aware of it. I would shy away from it just because of those negative side effects. If you, if you want to see the side effects, sometimes I'll do this with my patients who smoke and say, I just don't see the, the health issues here in me. I say, hey, check your blood pressure, smoke, or do the Zen packet. Wait about 30 minutes and check your blood pressure again, and you'll probably notice a sizable increase in the numbers there. Good idea. Good idea. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it and like your show. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Beth. We appreciate you calling. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your calls and questions about any kind of health care topic that you have an interest about. We're going to go to Judy from Meridian. Good morning, Judy. Hi, how are you? Good. What's your question this morning? So I have been tested. My heart's been tested um, with a nuclear test that came up with a problem in my left side um, and then I had a heart cath, and the heart cath was clear. There was no blockage, but I have um, some issues not getting in the oxygen um, coming in. So I guess both is the widow maker. Anyway, um, once that um, nuclear test um, was completed and the doctor got the results, all of a sudden there was a, like five or six medications that popped up that you know, said, you need to go pick these up. I didn't know what they were for. I knew they were some heart related. <laughs> I've never been able to talk to her about that. I picked them up and went through them. I thought I'm not taking half of these. I don't know what they're, you know, side effects are horrible. So, um, in the meantime, a month goes by and we tried to make the arrangements for me to have a meeting with her. And um, finally I called. I said, I need to know one way or the other what's going on here. I had I, the reason I called was an NPR report about AFib, which I believe I got. Anyway, didn't get a meeting. The nurse said, well, she saw that your heart cap was clear, so you can go off all the medicine, medication, and maybe you should go look for a primary care that could do, work you up for chest pain and not heart, not heart related. And I'm a little bit put out about that whole thing. Um, and also... 
is, is there something to what she said, or do I just need to go to UAB or some other place um, to find another cardiologist? Yeah, those are good questions. It can be sort of tricky to navigate that, and I'm sorry you've had sort of a, a rocky rocky road with it and not hadn't gotten all the information. So, you know, chest pain, when we, when we think about, like, how we normally test for that, there's several different ways as a progression. EKG is usually the first um, in the office, and then a nuclear test or some type of stress test that's basically stressing the heart and looking at the blood flow to the heart. Um, so, so they did that. And if you see something that's a decreased blood flow, they can't really measure directly oxygen levels, but they can measure blood flow that way. So if there's a problem there, then the most specific test looking at blood flow would be the cardiac catheterization. So they squirt dye, they look and make sure they're patent, that blood vessels are open. Um, and that works really well, even for relatively small vessels. So the large vessels, like you were talking about, the Widowmaker, the LAD, left anterior descending artery, circumflex arteries, all the major arteries, those are all... Um, you can see those really clearly on that cardiac catheterization. So um, now I, it, it's a shame that they, you know, suggested a bunch of medications without, you know, really explaining those, number one, and then sort of matching those up to what they what, what was seen. But um, you mentioned AFib, too, which is not necessarily a decrease in blood flow. It is a problem with the electrical conduction system of the heart. So right. you, you treat it a little bit differently. Now, you may still need to be on some of those medications. You may still need to be on, you know, I don't know what you were on, but there's a lot depending on what they saw. But honestly, if it was me and I was in this situation, I'd get a second opinion. And it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that they're going to redo all those tests, um, certainly get those records, take them with you. But I think uh, another cardiologist uh, at this point, I think going back to a primary care physician, that's not going to answer our questions. Um, right. And I'm a primary care physician, so I can tell you that. But, um, right. but yeah, I think I'd get a second opinion on things, that there may still be something else going on. And just because you've got good blood flow to the heart doesn't mean the function of the heart is good. So there's other things that can be going on there. Uh, with the heart and the electrical system. I mean, there's just a lot bigger picture than just the blood flow issue. That's really good information. I, I have a um, situation, I, I have dogs, and so I end up walking them in the heat and so forth. And I had my, uh, uh, not pulse right, but um, what is it, heartbeat, up to 116 for a minute. So two and a half hours, three went down. Yeah. And finally, it went down. I had major pain, like just three, three, four. And then it stopped. I just waited. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, okay, this is either nothing or it's something good. It's just, you know, gone down. And it went away. So it's something. Right. And, and they may need, you know, there's all kinds of other ways and tests to really tease that out like like the arrhythmia portion too you might be having arrhythmias that happen during those times that cause the chest pain uh there's something called a zeo patch which is just a little device that is taped to your skin it measures an ekg continuously you can wear that up to like weeks um sometimes up to a month you know even do some of those activities that you've noticed that that um those symptoms and they'll be able to see exactly what's going on with the rhythm of the heart so um Heart rate itself, not a big thing like, you know, if you're really active um, and you're doing a lot, um, you know, I'm, I try to stay active. I'm 53. My heart rate ranges from 46 all the way up to 190, and I feel very yeah. comfortable through that. So that's, you know, okay. but, but I've been doing a lot. I'm not saying get your heart rate up to that. I'm, you know, I'm just saying that's an, one example of somebody who's not young. <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I would get a second opinion on that, uh, Judy. I think that's probably the best thing to right. do. That's what I was thinking. I just didn't want to follow the instructions. It seemed like it was not the right course to take. So I really appreciate your help. Sure. All right. Thank you for calling. We're going to go to Bob from Hattiesburg. Good morning, Bob. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. I've got a follow-up question on A1C. Yeah. And maybe you covered it earlier, but A1C is advertised all the time. they got all kinds of uh, 
um, pills and potions that are advertised on television to get your A1C down. And it's a common phrase and common term everybody uses. If you look it up, it says A1C is your average glucose level over the past three months. Correct. Yeah. My, my question is, how do they measure that if you only provide blood one time for the test? Yeah, it's how, super cool, how Bob. Average over three months. We're about to nerd out. You ready, Bob? So this, this is yeah. super cool. So uh, what they have found is that glucose or blood sugar, so it's floating around in the blood, and it glycosylates. So glycosylation is where it, it chemically bonds with other things. And one of the things it bonds with is red blood cells. And it just so happens that red blood cells in your body last about 120 days. So um, wow. that's where we get that that average. So depending on the, the, per, the uh, concentration of glucose in your blood, it will glycosylate. If it's high, then it'll glycosylate more of those. It'll attach to more of those red blood cells. So the level will be a lot higher, and that's what they're, at, they're actually measuring is the, the glucose that's attached to the red blood cells. And because they last about three months, that's, what, that's how they can get that average. So super cool way of doing it that's sort of indirect. Now, if you have anemia that's severe, or you have a couple of other blood conditions, it's not the most accurate test. But for, say, 95% of the population, this is probably the best way to see what that average is. Well, thank you for explaining that, because I've asked techs at the, um, <laughs> you know, in the labs, and nobody seems to know exactly how it works. They just said it's an average. But You've totally explained it, and I uh, really appreciate the answer. Oh, you're welcome. Any, any chance I get to, like, explain nerdy things, that's cool. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Bob. Let's go to Trish in Laurel. Good morning, Trish. Good morning. My question is I ha is about seasonal allergies. I have really bad seasonal allergies, and I take Zyrtec, a generic Zyrtec. Would I be better said to get the real thing, or is there a better than Zyrtec out on the market now? Yeah, good question. So, you know, we have some medications that used to be prescription only like Zyrtec. Um, allergy medications, particularly the antihistamines, the sort of non-sedating or they should be less sedating antihistamines because they do have some sedation for some people. Um, things like Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, those all now are available over the counter and they're perfectly fine to get over the counter. Um, there's not really any difference in prescribing them. I have found that some people have a better response um, you know, to their allergies with one versus the other, um, or they notice that they have less side effects. So you, if you're not getting you know, complete control of the symptoms or at least a significant decrease in them with the Zyrtec, you may want to go to Claritin, uh, or uh, Allegra. And by the way, you know, once they're like, um, they're not, I'm using sort of the prescription names for them, but like I know a lot of people, Zyrtec is uh, Waltec, I think, is either Walgreens or, or Walmart. I can't remember which one, but they sort of had different names. So you have to, to look at that active ingredient, which is cetirizine for, for Zyrtec. Um, but they should be perfectly fine. You do want to watch out that there's not other things in there. So like some of them will have D on the on the name. So Zyrtec D, that's a decongestant. Probably don't want you probably don't need that for run of the mill allergies, except when they're really bad. Uh, and it can do some damage you know, to you. It can have, have other side effects, like if you have a hypertension that's uncontrolled or heart disease or that kind of thing. The other thing I like to tell patients is don't, you know, tr at least try some of the nasal washes and um, uh, topical Flonase, which is fluticasone, which is a topical steroid that just goes in your nose. Um, and that can work really well. And it's not something you're having to take that goes throughout the rest of your body. So a lot of people have some aversion to doing that. But I'll tell you, if, in, in, if predominantly that's your symptoms or in your nose uh, or down the back of your throat, 
that can have a, as big, if not a bigger influence in things. And you can hit it pretty hard if they're seasonal when you know it's going to come on. Like right now, oh, my goodness, we've got so much dust, dirt, all kinds of allergens blowing around because we don't have enough rain. You know, we really – that can certainly help – uh, cut those down by doing the nasal wash first, and you can do that a number of ways. There are applicator bottles that distribute that. There's a neti pot. There's all kinds of different ways to do that. Follow the instructions. Use one to two squirts of that over-the-counter Flonase right after that once a day. Uh, and then if you're still having symptoms, then you can add that Zyrtec, Allegra, or Claritin on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for calling. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions about any kind of health care topic that you might have. Let's go to Misty in Ridgeland. Good morning, Misty. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. I love the show. Oh, thank you. Um, I've got a question kind of related to diet and heart disease. Sure. Um, I've got what I was told is an elevated lipoprotein A. I don't really know the numbers. Um, my mom died when she was young of a heart attack, and so I got, you know, kind of a workup done. Um, so I've kind of tried to mitigate um, by a healthy lifestyle and diet choices, but I get really confused when it comes to dairy and full fat, and I wondered if you had any insight. Um, when you listen to communities kind of in the exercise nutrition world, they're all about healthy fats and full fat uh, kind of dairy. And then when I listen to some Instagram cardiologists that I follow, they are like, stay away from it. Uh, and I don't really know what to do for my case in particular. Any, yeah. Any insight there? Yeah. And so uh, lipoprotein A is one of the subcomponents of cholesterol panel that does have an increased risk of heart attack and stroke and cardiovascular disease as you get older. Um, and it's cumulative in effect. Um, and it can be modulated pretty substantially by diet and exercise, more so by diet. Exercise, I would still put in that, that recipe, though. And certainly, you know, everybody needs a certain amount of fat. And you can call it what you want, like plant-based, sterile-based, good fat, bad fat. But what it really comes down to is there are certain types of, of lipids, of fats, that are important and it tends to be better to get those from plant sources or to have limited amounts from animal sources so certainly <clears throat> some of the leaner meats like fish particularly it's cold water fish some of the omega-3 fatty acids that are in there are also beneficial to your cardiovascular disease prevention um, and other things too like cancer and uh, dementia um, so um, all of those are, are really important I don't know that I would, you know, I see some patients like it sounds like 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 yourself who really want to get into this. And that's great. They always do better when, you know, patients always do better when they take uh, responsibility for, for what's going on and say, hey, I'm going to do the best I can at working with this and see if I can have uh, a big impact. So but I'd, if you, you know, if you're going to go out with a group of other people once a month and have a, an eight ounce filet mignon. Um, hey, that's okay. That is not going to kill you. Um, so I am not one of those people who would say, don't ever eat this X. Now, if you say, well, doc, I, I just, I want to eat potato chips every day. Um, then I'll say, okay, you might want to stay away from those. Um, it might have a pull on you a little bit more than other things. I'm just using those as two examples. But, right. yeah, any any of the plant-based diets or things like a Mediterranean diet, a Cretan diet, the AHA on their website, if you look at heart.org, they'll have a very extensive heart-healthy diet that's based out of, off a lot of research and is very healthy for other reasons, too. Um, that is going to be much healthier in the long run. Now, I, I will say, again, you can modulate that cholesterol level. But a lot of that is determined um, by genetics. So don't yeah. be discouraged if you're doing all the right things and it's still not at the levels you want because you may be doing as much as you can. Um, genetics is just so hard, particularly on lipids, that, you know, if you're talking about there's a lot of differences in how we look at it. You know, if somebody comes in and their their lipid profile looks okay, except for the triglycerides are high. Well, I think I can modify that if they're not really high. Now, if their LDL is high or their life protein A is really high, then that may have a strong enough genetic component that I'm not going to be able to overcome that 
unless we do other things. But I definitely, definitely can have an effect on your overall health if you switch over to more plant-based diet. Plenty of fruits and vegetables can't go wrong with that. If you eat meat, eat things that swim or fly, um, and uh, just limit those other sources of fats and processed foods. Yeah. Um, I My cholesterol levels are all within the normal range that they have climbed. You know, real quick, Mostly I meant specifically I'll eat a yogurt every day because it's a great afternoon snack with protein, but it's like, do you eat full fat or no fat? You know, I do kind of yep. stay away from the meats because of all those reasons, but, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, and maybe I'm worrying about it too much and I should just eat what I want with the yogurt. <laughs> yeah, I think in that case, I would say the yogurt's probably okay. It's not going to have a significant negative impact on your health and it may have some positive benefits in other areas like calcium. Um, that you're going you're gonna to need for other reasons. So I think that's perfectly fine to do that, even if you're doing it every day. And I wouldn't worry too much about full fat, low fat, that kind of thing. I think you can just do the whole, if that's it, and you're not eating it every meal, every day, if you're just doing it maybe as you know part of your total plan that you do once a day, that's not going to have that much of a negative impact. Okay. And, awesome. Hey, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go to our last caller here who's been patiently waiting, Becky from Jackson. Good morning, Becky. Good morning, Jackie, but good morning. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Sometimes we, we mispronounce and we mis, misdo things. So, so, Jackie, go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is regarding uh, severe pain that I woke up with it the other night under my right breast. And it, it reminded me of gallbladder pain, but my gallbladder was taken out two years ago. Uh, it's, it was uh, accompanied by tension, I won't say pain, tension in my jaw on the right side and in my throat. And it also, another pain that it reminded me of was when I had lung cancer, before I was diagnosed with lung cancer. It was a severe pain that would just come and then it would just resolve itself. Because I've heard that women have jaw pain with heart attack, I took an aspirin, a baby aspirin. It resolved itself. It lasted maybe, the pain maybe lasted two or three minutes. I don't know if the aspirin had anything to do with it or it just resolved itself the way that the gallbladder pain used to. Right. Yeah, um, I, just to, we've got about twenty five seconds here, Becky. Okay. So I, I may I may cut you off a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I would say you probably need to get it checked out because of the previous history of lung cancer. It doesn't sound typical of lung cancer, but since you had that same symptom before, that would be on my radar. I think a physician needs needs to do a quick one over. They may get some tests like an EKG, a chest X ray, maybe some other scans to sort of look at things. Um, but I would just be a little bit more cautious, particularly with that history. So that's that's what I would say on that. Okay, now in March I had my, my exam for me, a month, three or six months. Yeah. Oh, and it, it was clear for the lung cancer. Yeah. But yeah. Not not necessarily. You can have something in the in the bile ducts though, so they may and they can test for that too. There's a way to test for that. Uh, typically, oh. when they take it out, it doesn't cause any problems. There's a lot of stuff in that area, so I just have it checked out. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening and for contributing to our show. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.